Good to see y'all. Thanks. Beautiful day, huh? It's only 25 to 6, so we have a lot of time today. <laughs> you didn't know you were here that early. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been given um, lately a lot of information, revelation, insight on the time that we're living in and this is just like kind of the beginning because I really want <clears throat> I want everybody to be prepared for what's coming we need to be prepared and, and a lot of churches they don't mentally prepare their people for what's coming they just never have, and they, and they refuse to because of their beliefs. But um, we have some things coming that, as believers, we can prepare for and we can be spiritually ready for. Um, and so this is just the, like the very beginning of it. But this is called Holy Heathens. Zephaniah 1. The great day of the Lord is near. It's near, and it hastens greatly. The voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of thick cloud or a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men, that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land." How many know this pretty powerful scripture? How many don't read Zephaniah very often? So I was thinking about this, and this is the thing that came to my mind. How many realize that there's an elephant in the room? You know, even the people who are aware of the elephant in the room seem to be distracted by the massive amount of ants that are also in the room. The ants are everywhere. And they seem to be increasing daily. How many understand that the saying, an elephant in the room is metaphorical, but then again, so are the ants? So you would ask me, what do they represent? Well, the ants represent every distraction that Satan uses to increase Babylon's influence. That's the ants. We've studied Babylon a lot. In fact, we're going to look at it more in the future, but <clears throat> remember what Babylon means to flow in confusion. I think we mentioned that last week. So we have ants, and the ants represent the economy. How many know that's like a big deal right now? How many saw that they went digital now in, over in Europe? They're going, it's all, they're digitizing everything. And if you spend more than a thousand pounds, they'll put you in jail, in cash. That just was this past week. So the economy's like a really big deal, and not just here, because that's coming here, because they have to be able to control the population somehow. So the ants represent the economy and that distraction. And then there are ants that represent increasing poverty and crime. And then there are ants that represent the prices of fuel and food and literally everything that you go to buy is just ridiculous. And so they distract us. The ants represent the climate, represents the war in Ukraine, represents election fraud, and represents uh, all of the 
all of the injustice in, in our court system. The ants represent the coming global famine. And they've just announced that there's going to be more pandemics coming. These are all the ants of distraction. There are ants that represent the deterioration of our constitutional rights. One of the ants that I know is really big on conservative sites is that they represent the survivalist mentality. We see what's coming and we, we've got to do whatever to survive. And so there's a desperate call for people to begin to store up food and water and ammunition. And I know that one of the big things now that even a lot of preachers, when you listen to these preachers, they advertise, they say, you need to buy gold. How many have heard that? Buy gold, buy silver, invest your money in gold. This is like Christian websites, Christian preachers. There's so many ants that if you choose to look, you'll find yourself mesmerized. Not only by their numbers, but by their increasing numbers and their activity. How many understand that if you fixate on the growing number of ants, you'll gradually increase in confusion? How many understand that's what the devil uses is he uses confusion to distract the people? And in your ever-increasing confusion, you're going to completely overlook the elephant in the room. So what is the elephant in the room metaphorically. It's what is known as the great day of the Lord. And if we don't stop obsessing over the ants, we will tragically be completely unprepared for what's next. The great day of the Lord is mentioned specifically by the prophet Joel also. Look at Joel in chapter 2. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord comes, it's nigh at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Wow, sounds just like Zephaniah, doesn't it? As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and strong, there has not been ever the like. Neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devours before them, behind them a flame burns. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. It's so amazing, isn't it? The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and horsemen. So shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, they shall leap. Like the noise of the flame of fire that devours the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march everyone on his, own, on his ways and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the horses, or on the houses. rather. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great, and it's very terrible. Who can abide it? I want you to listen to this. I want you to understand this. How many understand that we aren't entering into the season of Satan? This is absolutely the day of the Lord. And Satan has become nothing more than a pawn. I saw this vividly. How many know a pawn is a chess piece of the smallest size and value? Metaphorically, a pawn is someone disposable 
that's only kept around for another's purpose. Don't be fooled. Satan's strength and influence may appear to be increasing. It's merely an illusion. He's nothing more than a puppet on the day of the Lord. This is the day of the Lord. Joel prophesied that the day of the Lord is great and it's very terrible. What does that mean? It means literally that will, it will encompass all of the natural and all of the supernatural realm at the same time. There's never been a day like this. You live in the greatest time in history. The day of the Lord will be beyond any terror that's ever been experienced in both the natural and the supernatural realms. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 24. He said, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Jesus says there's a day of great tribulation. The signs will point to it. Read the prophets, you will find, he says, there's a day of great tribulation. The word tribulation is the Greek word philipsis. It means a day of great pressure and affliction and trouble and suffering. And Jesus said it's going to be unmatched in global history. No matter what you've seen in history, all of the, the mass amounts of death and destruction that have come before us, this will, there'll be nothing that matches it. Nothing. How many find the thought of suffering disconcerting? Here's what we need to remember. The season belongs to the Lord, and His will alone will be done. The season belongs to to the Lord. He has claimed it since the earliest times. He's claimed the season as his own. And he calls it the day of the Lord. Michael Hopf wrote, hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. How many understand that in the day of the Lord, it's not a time for weakness? I have so many things over the next several weeks I want to show you and tell you. I want to encourage you to be strong in the Lord. Look again what Joel said in Joel 2 and 11. The Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and it's very terrible. Who can abide it? I want to give you one thing to consider. One of the things that I've heard, and I want to talk to you about this some more later, not this morning, but in another day, is a lot of the church has been taught that there's going to be a pre-tribulation rapture. And I want you to know that it's not true. I'm going to show you over the next couple of weeks, but I want you to know it's not true. And why do I want you to know that it's not true? Because I want you to prepare yourself. I want you to prepare your heart for whatever comes. I want you to be prepared. I want you to make a decision in your own heart for what's coming. I don't want you to be surprised. If you're not willing to suffer and die for what you claim to believe, you don't really believe in what you say you believe. See, in order to really believe something, you've got to be willing. The disciples believed what they said to the point that they were willing, without a thought, to lay their life down, to suffer for what they believed. It's never been, I said this last week, it's never been a reality in the United States. 
but it's becoming a reality. I heard just a clip on, on I would like to just once in a while, there's prophets I like to hear what they have to say. And, and they'll prophesy things that just are, inspire me. Not as far as excite me, but just let, to let me know what time it is. Jonathan Kahn was talking the other day. How many have heard of Jonathan Kahn? How, how many like to listen to Some of his stuff is just phenomenal, isn't it? And he said... The school shooting at the Christian school. See, a lot, even on news clips, they're saying it's these right wing conservative Christians that are causing all this trouble. And that's going to become their rhetoric. That's going to become what they're, they're going to start saying it. Rick Joyner prophesied. There have been so many prophets in the past that have prophesied about this. And what we see happening right now. It's going to escalate. It's already been prophesied over the years in the 80s and 90s and even before. And Jonathan Kahn was saying how this, this person, this name Audrey Hale, came into that school and, they, and that Audrey Hale, he, he likened unto a scripture where Jesus went and he cast this spirit the, the legion out of the demoniac. How many remember that? And the Bible talks about the demoniac and he says he, he, he lived, he abode in, in the tombs. Right? He abode in tombs. And if you look it up, it literally translates that he abode in hollows of the rock. He, he, he was one who abode in hollows. He said, this person, Audrey Hale, if you go back in the history of her name, I don't remember if he said what, what, what she came from, whether she was Irish or whatever. He, it, that person was, but their name, Hale, literally translated one who abides in tomb or in hollows. And he said, when this person walked in with a gun, they had no idea who they were going to shoot. Or, or how many they were good? They shot. There were six. There were six people, three adults, three children. The three adults were right at sixty years old. And Jonathan Kahn said it was six, six, six. He knew what that person, that Audrey Hale. He knew what he was going after. Not him himself, but the spirit knew. The Spirit was making a declaration that this means war. And the children, he said, were all nine, nine years old. And Satan always uses inverted things, an inverted alphabet, and inverted numbers. And those 999 nine, nine is actually 666 six, six also. And he said, this is a declaration of war being shouted out by Satan. So I want you to know something. You've got to decide in your heart, like Jesus said, decide in your heart. When they bring you before a judge, already decide in your heart you're not going to defend yourself. Remember Jesus said that? Already settle it in your heart. We've got to settle it. Every day we've got to settle it in our heart. What do you believe? Is what you believe in worth dying for? The voice of the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and terrible, and who can abide it? Joel is literally prophesying that this season will become so naturally destructive that no one will be able to abide it. That's what he said. It will be an unlivable time. We don't like to hear that. How many would rather be raptured? Yep, right? No one can abide it. Who can abide it? The word is kun in, in Hebrew. It means you can't physically get this. You ready? This is what Joel said. The day would become so terrible that you can't physically prepare for it or make provisions for it or have any natural potential to get ready for it. That's the literal Hebrew. 
Remember again what Zephaniah prophesied. Neither their silver nor their gold will have the power to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. So there goes that out the window, right? Store up gold. God already said, snuck in out. The Lord's wrath will in the natural realm be inescapable. Not in the natural. How many know we need to be spiritual people in the last day? Because in the natural, it's inescapable. There will be nothing in the natural realm that anyone can do to defend or protect themselves during this season. You can store up guns. You can store up ammunition. It's not going to do you any good. Not in this season. That's what the prophets said. Look again at Zephaniah's prophetic description in verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near, it's near, and it hastens greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. Zephaniah declares twice, didn't he, the nearness of the great day of the Lord. Remember, something declared two times reveals that the thing is established and it's unavoidable. How many wanted to just die in peace in old age and not have to worry about any of this? You wanted it all to just be behind you. I pray that you all live to be 110. That rotten preacher. Hey, misery likes company. As Zephaniah sees in the spirit, he expresses a great urgency for all who can see to prepare for what is to come. He said it hastens greatly. The word hastens means mahar. It means to make something to become increasingly liquid. What does that mean? At one point, you know yourselves, you who were Christians in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. It just seems spiritually like everything was moving along slowly, almost like thick molasses, right? And then suddenly, how many have noticed that there's been a suddenly? Over the course of just a few short years, it began to flow like water rushing, gaining speed. Things that you never would have thought even 10 years ago, then all of a sudden is. How many are aware that trouble is accelerating globally? Look at verse 15 again. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. The prophet describes it as a day of wrath. The word wrath is abra in the Hebrew. It means anger and rage, very passionate outbursts, an overflow of pent-up fury. That's the day of wrath. He says it's a season of trouble, sorrow, tribulation, affliction, distress, and anguish. The word distress in Hebrew is metzdukal. It translates a season where the walls will be closing in on humanity. How many feel like that? How many over the last few years it felt like the walls have been closing in, right? People feel trapped in a place where there's going to appear to be no escape. It feels like impending doom, doesn't it? You know why? Because it is. We want to think that this is all going to just blow away and be behind us. We want to think that. It's not. It's not. Jesus prophesied this exact same thing in Luke chapter 21. He said this, There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. And upon the earth there'll be distress of nations with perplexity, and the sea and the waves will be roaring. Jesus actually called the season that we're in the day of vengeance. That's a terrifying thought, isn't it? The day of vengeance. It's really terrifying when you know it's not Satan's day. This is the day of the Lord. He calls it the days of vengeance. The word vengeance is the word revenge. It means a reckoning. 
It means to fully punish by inflicting hurt or harm on someone for an injury or wrong suffered unjustly. How many know Jesus was crucified unjustly? When Jesus said there will be distress of nations, the Greek literally translates the same as the Hebrew that was used by the prophet Zephaniah. Jesus said it will be a time that is inescapable where it feels like the walls are closing in. The world is being corralled into a terrifying situation which is absolutely unavoidable. Why are you telling us this, Dan? How many would rather have the truth than just have it surprise you? How many remember the story where God destroyed Egypt? <clears throat> Moses came to Pharaoh and he said, let my people go, didn't he? And what did Pharaoh do? The Bible says he refused. Now. Nah. So the Lord turned the water into blood. <clears throat> if you saw the water, because the, the Bible says it was the, the river, all the rivers in Egypt, the Nile that they worshipped, they said even the pots of water in their houses turned to blood, right? If you saw the pot of water on your counter turn to blood, it wasn't red water. It was blood. How many would say, yeah, I think we ought to let the people go? How many of that would have been enough for you? No more tricks. I'm good. I believe you. You know, but the Bible says Pharaoh refused to repent, didn't he? So God sent frogs. And then God sent lice. And then it says God sent swarms, which is actually wild animals came and began killing off people and pets, swarms of wild animals. Then their livestock died. Then the people got boils. Then came thunderstorm with massive hail that killed everything left outside. Then came locusts. Next came three days of darkness. And finally, the firstborn in every family died. How many know we serve a terrifying God? If you were a citizen of Egypt, just a citizen, you know, just some ordinary person who wanted to live on your little farm with your little family, just surviving, eating, working, sleeping well at night, right, raising your children. If you were that person in Egypt, at what point would you have been thinking, Pharaoh must have dementia? Right? Rings a bell, don't it? Pharaoh still has dementia. He never changes. How many understand that there was nothing that anyone could do to alter the course of the steps of judgment? Here's what you need to know. Once the season of judgment begins, it's unstoppable. You can pray all you want, you can beg all you want, you can plead all you want, but once the season begins, it's unstoppable. God is single-minded. There's nothing that can be done to change the course of events. So here in verse 15, Zephaniah prophesies that the day of wrath will be a day of wasteness and desolation. In Hebrew, he wrote these words, uh, Sho'ah me sho'ah. That's what he said. Sho'ah me sho'ah. It translates, there will come one devastating storm after another. Zephaniah said that. How many saw the shocking violence that fell in the little town of Rolling Fork, Mississippi, when the Cat 4 tornado literally ripped it off the map? And then again in Alabama. And did you see how the trees looked like they went through a shredder? Can you imagine the force of the violence behind that storm? 
Zephaniah prophesied this 2,600 years ago. 2,600 years ago, we all thought we were going to get out easy. I think it's already started. I think we're seeing tribulation as we speak. He says there will be darkness and gloominess. The word darkness is koshek. It means misery and sorrow and death will increase continually, exponentially. I saw a guy that wrote a book. He was a believer, but he did this massive research. And he's, it was something about that people are dropping dead all over the world for no reason. They don't know why. And a lot of them are are young people. A good friend of mine just told me that his, his, uh, his daughter-in-law's brother, his daughter-in-law, uh, I know his son, I've known him for many, many years, just, just, they're just kids, you know, just like the early 30s. And his, his, his daughter-in-law's brother, it was only like 40, early 40s, Said he didn't feel good and she went to work and came home and he was dead in the bed. And they don't know why. He's just dead. And they said it's happening all over the world. He prophesied that this was going to happen. They said this has never happened in the history. In the history, recorded history, this has never happened. Like it's happening now. He said there will be gloominess. It means it will become increasingly dark as the global outlook becomes increasingly depressing and discouraging. How many know people are depressed and discouraged more than at any time in history right now? How many know what happens when people become depressed? Drug abuse goes up. Alcohol abuse goes up. There's massive spikes in overdose deaths and suicides as the world spirals into hopelessness. Then he goes on to prophesy that it will be a season of clouds and thick darkness. Again, this is Zephaniah saying the same thing twice. He literally says there will be a day of clouds and heavy dark clouds. It's actually mentioned by the prophet Joel also when he says there will be blood and fire. And then he says and there will be pillars of smoke. I believe that much of the cloudiness during this day of wrath is going to come from probably volcanic activity which I'll show you in the next couple of weeks, and nuclear war, which the Bible prophesies also in Revelation. It's one of the trumpets. He says it'll cause great clouds and thick darkness. This is the day of wrath. Death and destruction like nothing before in human history. Look at verse 17 again. And I'll bring distress upon men, and they'll walk like blind men because they've sinned against the Lord. How many know it's time to get every sin out of your life? I'll tell you that every week. I'll tell you it every week from now on. It's time to get all the sin out of your life. He said, because they sinned against the Lord. How many know when you sin, you sin against the Lord? Even when David killed Uriah and took his wife, he said, it's against you and you only that I've sinned, O oh God. He says, they'll walk like blind men because they've sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh even as dung. It's amazing that the prophets of the Old Testament would repeat themselves. How many know the prophets continually repeated the same thing because God wanted to warn us? How many know God looked right down through the corridor of time and he saw us? Listen to Jeremiah's description of this same season. You ready? This is pleasant. This is Jeremiah. He says, in that day, those that the Lord has slaughtered will fill the earth from one end to the other. No one will mourn for them or gather their bodies to bury them. They'll be scattered on the ground like manure. So Jeremiah said about the same day. Nobody preaches as much. You know why? It doesn't draw in big crowds. 
How many would rather be ready, though, than be surprised? I don't want to be surprised. You have a big growth on you, and the doctor goes, ah, I wouldn't worry about it. I wouldn't worry about it if I was you either. It's on me. It's not on you. Zephaniah writes, I will bring distress upon men. See that? First line. And I will bring distress upon men. I will bring increasingly destructive storms. I will bring sorrow and misery to humanity. I will bring calamity and terror to men's lives. Who's he talking? Who's this talking? I will. I will bring distress. I will. Who is this I? You want me to show him to you? Look at Revelation chapter 6. I'll show you who the I is. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of the mighty wind. And the heavens departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. Who shall be able to stand? Amazingly, when you read these scriptures, it sounds just like Zephaniah and Joel's prophecies, doesn't it? The entire last day scenario of untold death and carnage is completely orchestrated by Jesus himself. It's a terrifying thought, isn't it? Remember in Luke 21, Jesus referred to this as the day of vengeance. Again, it means a season to fully punish someone for an unjust suffering or for a suffered wrong. Because of humanity's sins, Jesus <clears throat> was br brutally shamed and he was brutally tortured and he was savagely murdered. You can't put it any other way. Jesus was murdered. And because of humanity's pride, they've refused to repent and surrender their fealty to him. They've refused to pledge allegiance to him because of their pride. And humanity's ignored the repeated warnings, refusing to give up their sin. And now suddenly the day's upon us. And this is amazing, and I never saw this before. But he's coming back to avenge his own death. This is something that has never happened before in the history of humanity. That one could come back and avenge his own unjust death. Here in verse 17, John writes that the season of wrath will give humanity no potential to naturally prepare. Combined with the prophet, the prophecy of Zephaniah, this one fact is very clear. You can store up food and water. You can buy gold and silver. You can dig bunkers in the earth. But the wrath of the Lamb will find all who are living in sin, and each one will personally suffer his vengeance without any mercy. That's harsh, terrifying. There's a day of mercy, but then there's a day of judgment. Separate yourself from sin. So then if we cannot naturally prepare for what is right now beginning to happen, what can we do right now? How many know there's always an answer? How many want to know what the answer is? 
Zephaniah actually says it. Look at starting at verse 1 of chapter 2. Gather yourselves together, yea. This is right after he talks about the day of the Lord, the day of wrath. Zephaniah says this by the Spirit. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. This is amazingly prophetically directed at the church. You know why? Because he uses the word nation. Nation. The word nation is the Hebrew word goy. How many know the word goy means non-Jewish? How many understand that? He's talking to a non-Jewish people. Not of the birth of Jewish, Judaism, but of the new Jew, which we've been grafted into. Non-Jewish, literally, when he says this, he says, O oh, nation, it means non-Jewish heathens. Yeah. Peter called us a holy nation, didn't he? You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. The word holy nation literally translates, you are holy heathens. How many are thankful that he chose you as a heathen to be holy? He chose you. How many have been a heathen? Me and George. Thanks, George. I always like it when somebody gathers with you. So here by the command of God, Zephaniah says, gather together. Gather together. He says it twice. Gather together. Gather together. How many noticed that he said it twice? Gather together. Twice is for emphasis. It's exactly what the writer of Hebrews declared, again, by the command of God in Hebrews 10.25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. How many are aware that the day is approaching? The objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. Huh. 65 million Americans don't attend church anymore for one reason or another. 65 million who used to attend church don't attend church anymore. We went from a generation when I was a kid that went to church three times a week, right? To a generation that struggles to go once. Is it true? We know it's true. Why do we think God would have a warning in both Zephaniah and Hebrews about us gathering together? How many know this is a command of God to the last day church? How many know when I don't go by the command of God, then I just set myself up as a sinner? Because it's just rebellion. God knew that people would stop going regularly in the last day for one reason or another. He knew it. We don't miss meals, right? Heaven help us if we miss a meal. But one day a week, one day a week in the presence of God? I'm not going to preach on that. Then look what he prophesied next in Zephaniah 2. Before the decree bring forth. He says, start gathering together. When? Before the decree bring forth. Before the day passes the chaff. Before the fierce anger of the Lord comes upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. We can never say we weren't warned. He warns us and he... Whoever preaches this, you know why they don't? It's really uncomfortable to be up here. I'd much rather preach things that people shouted amen to. And I can. I was an evangelist. I can't run down the aisle like I used to, but I could probably walk that far. Who's he talking to? Remember the first verse. The holy heathens, the chosen, 
the church. That's who he's talking to. So this is also to the church. He's warning us. He's talking to us. What's the warning? Right now. God warns. He says, before, before, before. How many know we're quickly approaching the point of no return? We will soon have no more potential to change anything. God's looking at the church and he's saying, is that your final answer? Is that what you're going to go with? This is going to be your eternal answer? You're choosing that? Listen, this isn't a day to express your obstinate defiance. I saw a, uh, I saw a fellow that has spiritual dreams. This was probably a month or two ago. He has a lot of spiritual dreams. How many know you? The Bible talks about in Acts and Joel both. There's going to be a lot of spiritual dreams. And he said, I dream and I, I see Jesus a lot in my dreams. He said, but I had one the other night that was really disconcerting. He said, I saw Jesus. Walk, I, I didn't tell you this, did I? He said, I saw Jesus walking past me. And I said, hey, Jesus, because I'm used to seeing him in my dreams. And he said, Jesus completely ignored me. He was so angry that he didn't even look over. He said, the only thing I can see in his face was how angry he was. He said, I think Jesus is angry right now. How many know if Jesus is angry, it's time for me to be humble? The best time for me to humble myself in the sight of the Lord is when he's looking for vengeance. I want to be as small and as quiet and as invisible as I can be, right? <laughs> Last verse, 7, I, 2, 3. Seek ye the Lord, all you meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. Look what he says. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. How many love that verse? How many know there's hope right here? There's hope. How many know you can cling to that verse? I didn't even know that verse was there. I wrote this sermon. He said, I want you to go further, bud. The prophet is actually, through, by the Spirit of God, giving us advice on how to prepare for the day of the Lord. It has nothing to do with food or water. It has nothing to do with silver or gold. It has nothing to do with hiding in bunkers or caves. He says the heathen will hide in the caves and say, fall on us. I always thought that meant kill us, smash us, but it doesn't. It just means cover us. We don't want the wrath of the Lamb to find us. But he's telling you as believers how to get ready. He says, seek diligently for the presence of God. If you've ever sought the presence of God in your entire life, now is not the time to argue. Get in the lifeboat. The big boat's sinking. Seek diligently for the presence of God. Seek desperately to elevate in righteousness. Whatever you used to do, don't do it anymore. Whatever you used to ask forgiveness for, don't be that.
And the last thing he said is seek to walk in a level of broken humility before God that you've never experienced before. And then he says these words, and maybe, just maybe, you'll be sheltered from the terrible violence that will overwhelm all humanity on the day of the Lord's wrath. Amen. Stand with me if you would. Father, we worship and bless you for you are King and Lord. Your majesty, we honor you. We humble ourselves in your presence. We cry out to you for your mercy, O oh God. For we have been a people wandering, wandering in this wilderness time. And so many times we've been so far away from you. But Lord, we need to be close to you. We need to find that refuge, that shelter from the storm, which is only found in Christ. Lord, that we would seek you, your presence, more than ever before more than at any time, more than at any time. Maybe I told you this before, but the Lord spoke this to me one day and I told it to Carol and it, it witnessed with her, but it was something the Lord told me a long time ago. And how we've looked at so many things in the Old Testament that the Lord commanded from us. And, and in the book of Malachi, it says, Will a man rob God? And you say, how do we rob you? And God says, you have robbed me in tithes and offerings. And so we've preached for years that that was money that we owed God. And that's fine. That's kept the churches functioning and, and whatever. It's, it's, that's... It's amazing because we, we, then we've created a whole culture of stewarding money and money's become such an idol in the church. And that's not at all how that translates into the New Testament heart. I mean, it, this is still a sacrifice and I understand that and it's fine and it's, I, I, you know, you give as unto the Lord. But the offering that you owe God, the 10% that you owe God is actually your time every day. And that comes out to about two hours and 40 minutes. And that doesn't include the, the that's just the tie. That's not even the offering. Offerings show your love. Offerings are what you give above and beyond. But he's demanding the tithe from you. He's demanding it. This is a new day. You say, Dan, teach us how that we can make it through this time. I'm telling you how you can make it through this time. Begin to seek his presence like never before. Begin to give him time that you've never given him before. Don't rob God. Now you know, don't rob God anymore. Make, give, I think she told me, I said to Carol, how much time is that? I think she said it's the tenth of a, is 10% is 240? Two hours and 24 minutes a day. You are, that's your tithe. And your offering is what you give him out of love. How can I survive in this last day, Dan? This is how you can survive. Seek his presence. Zephaniah said it 2,600 years ago. In the day of wrath, if you want him to cover you, seek his presence. Humble yourself before him. Get the sin out of your life. Walk in a higher level of righteousness. Be aware of righteousness. Be aware of righteousness. Walk in a level of righteousness that you, you say, I, yes, you can. You can because you know what I know you're aware of? You're aware of your stomach growling. You're aware when you're tired and you need sleep. This is more important than that. This is the most important thing. This is your eternity. And it's right around the corner. It's standing right around the corner. He's saying, is this how you want to come into eternity? How do you want to meet me? How do you want to face to face with me? 
You want to say, Lord, I gave you everything or I gave you this little bit, but there were days I didn't, really didn't give you much of anything. There were days I understand where I kind of ignored you, Lord. And God's saying, I'm your only source of protection. You say you love me. You say you love me. But you give all this time to yourself and your own life. And you rob me. You're robbing me. Don't rob me anymore. Don't rob me anymore. That is really strong in the spirit this morning. Will a man rob God? It's a day of vengeance. I don't want to be on his, I don't want to be on his revenge list. I want to be one of those who he's marked. The Bible talks in Revelation that there will be those who are marked by God as his own. Are you worthy to be marked by God as his own this morning? Father, that we would walk in righteousness, that we would walk in humility. That we would walk, Father, continually in sacrifice before you, unto you. Sometimes he won't even let me call him by his name. I just have to come and I humble myself and I just am only allowed to say your majesty. Your majesty. I humble myself before you, your majesty. Cleanse your hands. Cleanse your hands before God. Father, we pray that you would give us a new revelation of our life with you, that we would see ourselves, that we would see ourselves, that we would examine our hearts. God is looking for those who will examine their hearts. Those who are willing to lay their entire life in his hands this morning, trusting him. Do you trust him? Give him your life. Give him all of it. Quit taking it back. He wants me to tell you this. Stop taking it back. You give him a day or two and then you go back to you. Stop it. He's watching. He's watching. He watches every move. He tests to see if you really love him. He watches your life. Stop taking it back. Honor him with your life. Honor him. Honor him. He's worthy. And he's coming with vengeance. And you want him to know you. To recognize you. Spend time in his presence. You want him to recognize you. On that day. Father, we worship you. King Jesus, we honor you, for you are worthy. You are our king. You are our beloved. We call you king and Lord. Hallowed be thy name, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.